Since Valentine's Day is so near, it only seems right to look at a movie that stars People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive. I'm too sexy for my shirt. Too sexy for my shirt. So sexy it hurts. I'm a model. You know what I mean? And I do my little turn on the catwalk. Yeah, on the catwalk. On the catwalk. Yeah, I do my little turn on the catwalk. Good, now that's over with. No more of that until Thor The Dark World. Comic book movies are often criticized for not following the source material. My opinion on such things is fairly simple. If it's a change that is creative and fits within the change of format, being from a comic book to a movie screen, then I view it as good. If it's a change for the sake of change, or a change that is worse than the source material when the source material would have fit just fine, that's terrible. The reason I bring this up in my Thor review is because this film presents us with a very different version of Thor's time on Earth. The variations are fairly major, yet I find myself unsure if they are good or bad. They present a different story. It's not change for the sake of change, so that's a plus. In the comics, Odin decides Thor must learn humility, so he banishes him to Earth. And immediately you think, I might as well have just summarized Act 1 of this movie, and you'd be right. See, the changes here are how Odin banishes Thor. In both, he strips Thor of his powers and his hammer, and requires that Thor make himself worthy of the hammer in order to reclaim it. The big difference is in the comic book, Odin turns Thor into a normal human named Donald Blake. And if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because it's Easter egged into the movie. Oh. In fact, he's not a completely normal human. He is a human with a disability that requires that he use a walking stick. Donald Blake has no memory of being a god and simply grows up as a disabled human not realizing his true self until he happens into a cave. Within the cave, he finds another walking stick that turns out to be Majolnir in disguise. Mjolnir. Mjolnir. At this point, his powers are returned to him. I like this because we have Thor gaining the memories of a weak human, learning the humility to help him temper his great powers. Really reminds me of Captain America's origin. This might be another reason why they wanted to change the movie origin from the comic book, since Cap and Thor's origin movies were mere months apart. In the movie, Thor is banished to Earth, but he retains his memories. I need a horse! We don't have horses, just dogs, cats, birds. And give me one of those large enough to ride. He must learn humility as a normal human, but this has the added benefit of him also understanding how much he has lost. I think this is an interesting way to handle the character, and while this movie definitely doesn't do anything brilliant with this change in setup, I still find it interesting. And when I say this movie doesn't do anything brilliant, I mean it. We're still in the quality dip of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. These movies have gone steadily downhill after Iron Man, and while Thor is an improvement in quality over Iron Man 2, it's not a huge improvement, and it's also not clear if Marvel is trying to become better or just settling at a passable quality level. This isn't a tremendously bad romance overall. Chris Hemsworth and Natalie Portman have decent chemistry, but it really falls short when compared to other relationships we have in the MCU. Tony and Pepper feel like two people who've known each other forever, and when their romance forms, it feels very natural. Now you might think, but they had multiple movies to develop a relationship. Then let's compare this to a relationship that had only one movie, Steve Rogers and Peggy Carter. Go get him. These two might be my favorite couple in the MCU, and it's debatable if they ever actually are a couple, as they never do establish any sort of relationship, yet I feel a close attachment between them. Here, the chemistry seems completely dependent on the actors, as their dialogue is very bland and unexciting. Essentially, here is their romance in a nutshell. Hey, you're hot. Hey, you're hot too. Wanna probe the inside of my mouth? You got it. Is this a kissing book? I don't 
don't know if you're delusional or if you're pulling some kind of con. I don't care. Just care about her. I've seen the way she looks at you. I swear to you, I mean her no harm. Good. In that case, I'll buy another round. You leave town tonight. I think it's bullshit for Selvig to ask Thor to leave town and not to be around Jane. Jane is a grown-up who can make her own choices. He's not her father, so I'm not sure why he's trying to behave like he is. And even if he is her father, she's a grown-up. However, he is drunk, so it can be excused. The real issue is that Thor agrees to stay away from Jane, then almost instantly decides to hang out with her. I feel like this is handled better when you look at the deleted scenes. We get the scene of Thor helping Selvig to his bed because he's crazy drunk, but unless you look at the deleted scenes, you don't really see how drunk he really was. In the deleted scenes, we see Selvig and Thor joking around and becoming friends. Another! <laughs> And we also see Selvig was insanely drunk, most likely because he's trying to match drinks with Thor, to the point where it would have been dangerous to leave him. Thor does the honorable thing and carries him home to bed. It really helps show that these two did develop a friendship, and assuming Selvig remembers the night, that Selvig now views Thor as an honorable person. And no matter how crazy Selvig thinks he is, he now knows that Thor is a good person at heart. But these are deleted scenes, they don't count. This movie makes it out to be, you need to get away from Jane and get out of town. Okay, sure. I understand that Odin needs to go into Odin's sleep once in a while, essentially just to recharge his batteries. But unless you know that going in, it just looks like Loki and Odin are talking, and out of nowhere, Odin decides to take a nap on the stairs. Well, what? Oh man, what time is it? But I'm so tired. Oh, I'm so sleepy. They don't really explain this in the movie, and any time a movie requires you to do homework outside of viewing the movie, it means the movie failed at doing part of its job. And they send me away to teach me how to be sensible, logical, or responsible, practical. I know it's sacrilege to say Loki sucks at this point in time, but the entire reason he's thought of as a badass villain is because of the Avengers. No one thought twice about Loki here. It's not really that he sucks here as much as he doesn't make any sense. If it's any consolation, I think you're right. Is he not known as a deceiver at this point? Has he been the honest and good Loki until the beginning of this movie? Because characters take him as word and trust all the crappy advice he dispenses throughout this movie. I find it hard to believe, but it's the only explanation that makes sense here. And you might think, but Loki has a complete plan throughout this movie to take the throne. And you would be right, but this is baffling. First we have to assume that he's completely good until the movie starts. Then he becomes becomes evil and puts his plan into motion, otherwise nobody would trust him. Then you also have to completely ignore the scenes that imply his motivation towards becoming a villain, because that happens midway through the movie and he already has the frost giants breaking into the vault at the beginning. Why? So you could literally cut out all the cool stuff that explains that Loki is really a small frost giant child because that literally means nothing in this movie. Tell me! He is doing evil stuff before this and continues doing evil stuff afterwards. Is it madness? Is it? Is it? Best explanation I can think of is that Loki decided to ally himself with the Frost Giants with their full plan. Then, upon finding out his true heritage, he decided to betray the Frost Giants and take the throne for himself. Your death came. But why was it necessary to get Thor out of the way if he was just going to have the Frost Giants take over anyway? Getting Thor out of the way only makes sense if he's going after the throne himself. It's a muddled mess at best. I could have done it, Father! I could have done it! For you! 
I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody. Unlike other weaknesses with this film, this one is probably more muddled if you look at the deleted scenes. There you see that Loki is a troublemaker to the point where Thor isn't phased for a second when Loki commits mischief. Loki. <laughs> now that was just a waste of good wine. So even if Thor were foolish enough to listen to Loki, which I would say seems likely given how he behaves at the beginning of the movie, surely Lady Sif or Hogan, who both seem fairly level-headed and logical, would warn Thor that he shouldn't listen to Loki's advice. Ah, Loki, I know you're always deceiving and tricking people every chance you get, but surely this one time you're being trustworthy. Really? This movie's gonna introduce Hawkeye then not have him fire a single arrow? Really? You better call it Coulson. I'm starting to root for this guy. It's important to remember why Thor was exiled to Earth. It was a punishment by his father. Now think about it. He has been stripped of all his powers, and now he has no choice but to hang out on Earth, and his only source of entertainment is to flirt with Natalie Portman. Oh, the humanity! Surely this is a fate worse than death. That's part of the problem with this version. I never feel like Thor truly hits rock bottom. Compare him with the other major origins in the MCU. Tony Stark is captured by terrorists and forced to install a battery in his chest or die a slow death. And Steve Rogers, hell, he spends most his life at rock bottom. Problem is, Thor never gets anywhere near as down as those two. I feel like he has hit rock bottom when he's unable to lift his hammer and he finds out Odin is dead. Okay, but I never get the sense that he has embraced his humanity. This brings me to a deleted scene that I felt would have helped this. Essentially, Thor goes to the cafe where he broke the cup and brings them a new cup. Excuse me, Isabella. Oh to replace the one I broke, please forgive me for my behavior. Okay, thank you. This is cheesy as hell, but I kind of like it. It reminds me of the grenade scene in Captain America the First Avenger. It works because it's true to the character. The cup works well because it shows that he is now embracing his new life. He is accepting that he is just a normal human and will have to treat people and property with respect that he didn't before. At the beginning of the movie, he flipped an entire table in a spoiled fit, yet now he views the cup he destroyed as an act that needs apologized for. It shows a real growth of the character, and that is really missing from this movie. One could argue that his growth is evident when he decides to sacrifice himself to the Guardian to save the town, and that is true, but I think it would have been good to get a moment like that before the battle, and that way his growth would feel more natural. It would also tell us that he cares for all the people in this town, whereas the movie leaves us thinking maybe he just cares for Jane and is making this sacrifice just for her survival. Thor proves to be a very average movie overall, but it is elevated with solid performances from the entire cast. I honestly feel like Chris Hemsworth could be a big action star. He has the right build and stage presence for it, and what he has over some action stars of the past is that he actually is a pretty damn good actor. I might have insulted Loki's plans in this review, but so much that is totally forgivable because Tom Hiddleston does a great job in the role. You really get the sense of fun and mischief from him, while also getting the feeling of the full death of disillusionment he must feel upon finding out that he isn't a son of Odin by birth. Hiddleston balances every weird thing this movie throws at him with a great sense of ease. Anthony Hopkins is a great actor and he could sleep through a role and still do a good job. Oh wait, he does sleep through this role. What, what? Oh man, what time is it? But I'm so tired. Oh, so sleepy. Everyone else is solid. I would have liked to see more of Renee Russo. Pretty much her entire role was cut from this movie. The director, Kenneth Branagh, does a great job of merging a world of fantasy with small town America seamlessly. And while I don't feel the movie fully exploits the changes in origin, I do like them. It would have been far too jarring to erase Thor's memory and appearance upon coming to Earth, essentially changing the main character between Act 1 and 2. It just wouldn't work. 
This isn't Hitchcock, this is a comic book movie. I also like that Thor maintains his memories. It means he knows how far he fell. In the comic book, he's just a weak guy and suddenly he's Thor, from our perspective at least. It worked there, but it means cutting large parts of Asgard from the story. And it's such a large part of the Thor film, providing a fantasy world to give us a contrast between this world and the more sci-fi elements of Iron Man's story. In the end, I give this movie a 7 out of 10 and consider it the 4th worst movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe or maybe I should say 7th best. Meh, it's a solid film and a welcome upgrade from Iron Man 2. What's this doing here? That's it. Bring this to me. You know what this is? It's exactly what I need to make this work. Lift the coil. Go, go. Put your knees in it. There you go. And drop it. Drop it. Perfectly level. If you're a fan of my channel and the content I produce, please make sure to visit my Patreon page and become a patron. If you sign up there, not only is there the option to become a producer, if you contribute a little bit more, you'll get your own title card with your name or your handle or whatever you want listed, as well as a website or anything like that within reason that you'd like to promote.